by Judy, The Song of Endless Sorrow, Part 2. So, uh, before starting to check the poem stanza by stanza, um, what would be the main topics, uh, what would be the main subjects covered by the poem? You could say that the main one is historical, so it's a recreation of a historical event that was relatively close to Baiyu Ji's own time and that was of monumental, epic importance in the history of China and more specifically of the Tang Dynasty. You could also say that it's very melodramatic yeah, and tragical. As I said in the previous video, uh, this episode would be taken for many operas and plays in later Chinese literature. So the poignancy of the fall from power of the greatest emperor of the dynasty and of the loss of his beloved concubine, you know, that gives for very great material, for, for very great tragic and dramatic and readable material. Like all the poems that describe the life of royalty or concubines, there is a slight voyeuristic element here always. Uh, as normal readers and commoners wouldn't be able to, to glance, uh, to take a peep at the life of emperors, uh, this sort of poems do generate that possibility with the showy uh, sights of a luxurious space full of uh, incredibly beautiful objects of gold, silver and different metals. Also a voyeuristic gaze on the women, including this extreme beauty that the emperor could enjoy. So, so there is a slightly erotic voyeuristic nature in this poem as well. And of course, Baijuji being as he was the Confucian, there is also a streak of moralism in the poem, you know, uh, uh, there's a mild but pretty clear criticism of the emperor who got besotted with love. So, so on the one hand, this is a redeeming quality, the intensity of love between the emperor and uh, his consort. But on the other hand, it's a sort of criticism because even though it's touched very lightly, except uh, as it is needed for the purposes of the poem, uh, the blame on the emperor for having uh, derelicted his duties is, you know, a very severe criticism by a Confucian. So, as we said before in the in the previous comment, uh, I would divide this poem into, let's say, four parts. The first part, which includes the first, uh, I don't know, six, seven stanzas of the poem, uh, describes us the rise of Jiang Guifei. So how she came to be the favorite concert, and uh, it dwells into the life of pleasure, the life of ease that was enjoyed by the emperor and his concubine. So it's the happy world of the pleasures together of emperor and concert. The second part, which is rather brief, represents this fall from grace. Yeah? The, the war and uh, the death, the execution of uh, Jiang Guifei, this is treated rather quickly. So this is a very short part. It could be um, it could be united with the next part of the poem, which describes the after effects of Jiang Guifei's death. The emperor's suffering and uh, his sleeplessness and uh, his, 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 his absolute interior depression and loneliness. And this has two scenarios in the poem, which act as subparts in that section in uh, Shu, in his first period of exile, and then back in the capital, and in the places he used to share with Jiang Guifei. Uh, the next section, which would be the fourth, if we, as, if, if I, if, as, as I said, we divide the, the, the death of Jiang Guifei and the longing of the emperor into two, the next section, the fourth, would deal with the quest for finding the spirit of Jiang Guifei, so it's a Taoist quest, and the part of uh, and, and a separate part, or again, you know, you could include it in this part, is the culmination of this quest in the dialogue between the Taoist and the ghost of Jiang Guifei, who is living in the fortunate islands of the East. So, first stanza: The Han Emperor craved women, and sought a perfect beauty. Years he ruled, and yet he had not found her. The young clan had a girl, just growing up, raised in the women's quarters. Few had seen her. Such beauty, a gift of heaven, should not be wasted. On the day they brought her to the palace, our ruler first saw her. A sidelong glance, a little smile from this beauty, 
and all the other women in six palaces came to nothing. So in the first time that we get uh, the emperor searching for a woman and the emperor finding her. Interesting couple of things to mention. Uh, the emperor is described in the first line as the Han Emperor. And we know this not to be true. This is a poem about a Tang dynasty emperor, about Tang Xuanzong. The reasons why a Han emperor is mentioned are twofold. On the one hand, we may suppose Bai Zhuji wants to be politely indirect. Remember, uh, poems on history and, and were, were usually employed for political criticism. Here we have a poem that is, however mildly, criticizing one of the emperors of the ruling dynasty. So it would be a matter of aesthetic uh, politeness, but also of practical uh, security and self-protection to try to place a, a little veil over the depiction of, of the ruler of the Tang dynasty himself. Anyway, there was an episode in the Han dynasty that was remotely similar to this, at least in the infa infatuation of emperor and concubine, which was uh, the relationship between Han Wu Di and Consort Li. And in that episode, the, when, when the concubine died, the emperor also used a, 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 a fang shi, a mountebank, a Taoist, uh, to try and bring the soul or the spirit of Consort Li back so that he could at least see her shadow in a screen. Other thing worth mentioning, uh, this beautiful woman, the hyperbole in the images at the end. So hyperbole is evidently the, the main literary trope to use with a woman of incredible beauty and in a poem which is about the endless sorrow of being separated from her. So a sidelong glance, a little smile, so the tiniest gestures, the tiniest viewing of this woman and all women in six palaces, thousands of concubines come to nothing because the emperors had many royal palaces and uh, many wives and concubines. So this beauty is so intense, all the others, all the six palace beauties disappear in a glance. Second stanza. In the spring chill they bathe her in the Hua Ching pool. The water of the warm springs glistened on her pale skin. Her maids lifted her out languid from the heat, and there for the first time she received her master's favour. Now this stanza is almost erotic, so this is the first encounter, gazes and looking uh, besides, of the emperor and his uh, beloved consort. She is washed, she is cleaned, and she is presented to him, we might imagine naked or scantily clad, for their first sexual tryst. So, you know, quite an erotic and direct uh, depiction, as is usual in the Chinese tradition. Uh, so this woman bathing in the Huaqing pool, the Huaqing palace was a palace east of the capital, east of Chang'an, that was built by uh, Emperor Xuanzong, I believe, and uh, it was the real place where Xuanzong and Jiang Wifei spent most of the time. It had uh, warm springs nearby, and uh, through canalization, these warm springs led into marble pools where the emperor and his concubine bathe themselves. In fact, you can still see today the beautiful marble pool in which legend and story says the emperor used to bathe with uh, Yang Wifei, where this scene that we have just read takes place. Next stanza. Her hair was like clouds in a golden headdress, her face a flower. They passed spring nights warm behind hibiscus curtains, spring nights so bitterly short, and yet the sun rose high. From that time on, he held no morning audience. The emperor is besotted after this first night. He spends a lot of time. The beauty of the woman is described through a couple of images, hair like the clouds, face like a flower, and spring nights feel all too short for the emperor in his enjoying the pleasure with this woman. So this is a beautiful scene. But it's also anticipatory in a negative way. The emperor is besotted. The emperor is distracted. He abandons his morning audiences for spending time with this beauty. And that's not a good thing. Endlessly they sought pleasure at parties and banquets. Endless love they sought in endless spring, night and night again. And so these pleasures kept going on and on and on. Endlessness is a very recurrent trope in the poem. Uh, endless is their pleasure or their search for pleasure now. Endless will be their sorrow when as a consequence of these pleasures, death 
separation and suffering ensue. In harem palaces, 3,000 beauties, but all were nothing, and one was everything. In her golden room, her makeup perfect, she alone would serve him. After banquets, in jade towers, wine fed their passion. So again, this stanza summarizes and recapitulates the images that were and the topics that were developed in the previous ones. So all the beauties of the palace, the 3,000 favorites are ignored, uh, and the emperor enjoys his concubine in a superb and sumptuous scenery, a golden room in jade towers, and apart from sensual and sexual pleasure, we have wine drinking. So this is the satisfaction of all earthly desires. Next stanza. Her sisters and brothers were all ennobled. Everyone envied the glory she brought to her clan. Until through the world, parents' hearts prayed for a daughter and not for a son. So this is, this is partially based on history. Jiang Guifei had such an ascendancy over the emperor that her relatives did manage to get important courtly positions. In fact, I think her, her brother or cousin managed to become prime minister. So it is true, she is at the zenith of her glory and her power. Not only has she besotted the emperor, Jiang Guifei uh, favors her family, and this creates envy. And again, the, the accumulation of hyperboles in the poem uh, is represented in the fact that the poetic persona says that everybody in the world, all the, peop all the parents started praying when they had children for daughters and not for sons. Of course, in the hope of imitating in a beautiful daughter, the success and the protection that Jiang Guifei afforded her family. This, of course, is an extreme hyperbole um, in Chinese society. It was considerably misogynistic, we could say. And uh, women were always seen as something negative as compared to children, to male children. Male children would continue the family tradition. They would inherit property. They would expand the family property. They would preserve the family name. And in, in the Confucian and Xinjiang, official ideology, they were the strong, the active element. Women left the family, changed their surname, took property away through dowries, so they were a loss. And then they were inferior, they, 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 they were the jinn. Uh, they, they had to occupy a subordinate position and then do things subordinate to men. But so topsy-turvy is the world now that because of Jiang Guifei's success, people, hyperbolically, we know this is not real, would prefer to have daughters than sons. Her new palaces rose on Mount Li, touching the clouds, and everywhere magical music drifted on the wind. These palaces on Mount Li are the same as the Hua Qing palace that I've mentioned before. And uh, Jiang Guifei was a great mm, dancer. I think she also played some musical instruments. The emperor himself was quite a good flute player. So apart from the sensual pleasures of the flesh, both types of flesh, uh, the emperor and his concubine enjoyed themselves with music. And that's the music, the musical sound drifting from the palace. Softly she sang and softly she danced to the music of flute and strings. Day after day the emperor watched and listened, craving more. But the sound of other music, martial drums, came from Yujiang, and it shook the earth ending her dance of the rainbow dress and the feathered coat. So with this stanza, we finish the first part of the poem. The emperor was enjoying music, but another music, not so pleasant to his ears, is coming. The music of war drums in the northeast, General Al Lushan, eh, in fear of losing his position in his life after some courtly intrigues, decides to rebel, and he has massive armies at his disposition, and he starts the campaign from Yujiang against the capital the campaign which will bring the Tang dynasty to its knees. To its knees. Uh, rainbow dress, feathered coat, they were special dances that uh, Jiang Guifei danced herself and that were, I think, designed for her, created for her. So now, very briefly, we get the catastrophe. What happens? And this is described very briefly in uh, three stanzas, and one of them only a couplet. The first one. The nine-storied city gates were wrapped in smoke and dust. 
as a thousand chariots and ten thousand men rode out to the southwest. So everybody is fleeing the city. We don't get any battles or, or, or any skirmishes in the poem itself. So we just have the drums of war sounding and the emperor and his court fleeing the capital in the direction of the southwest. His banners waved in the wind as they marched and then stopped. West of the palace gates, only 30 miles or so. The six armies would go no farther. What could he do? They dragged his beauty to her death beneath their horses. So this is the culmination, uh, what we explained in the previous poem. After reaching the outskirts, just 30 miles from the capital, the army mutinies and demands the death of Jiang Guifei and her relatives. Otherwise, they will not continue to escort the emperor to his uh, refuge in Shu. The emperor is devastated. He wants to refuse, but in the end he has to give way and Jiang Guifei is executed. And the execution is not depicted with much detail. It's just presented. The next stanza will, will show us her dead body in a pathetic uh, image or set of images, but we, we don't get much of the clear description except she died in front of the horses. Actually, she was strangled uh, by a eunuch with a silk cord. Her flowery pin fell to the earth. No one retrieved it. Nor the jade and golden ornaments from her hair. Her emperor hid his face. He could not save her. When finally he looked, her blood and tears had run together. So the harshest image in the poem, the emperor cannot save her. The golden ornaments, which are a part of her, and her are destroyed, fall into the dust, blood and tears commingled when the emperor dares to look. So now the next part of the poem becomes a bit more descriptive, as we said, and we get uh, the narration of how the emperor escapes and reaches the area of Shu and how he later moves on to the imperial capital once the, the troops under his son's command have regained the imperial seat. So here we get the emperor at Shu. Getting to Shu, Shu was in the west of China. It was a landlocked territory protected by mountains, high mountain passes. So it was difficult to, to penetrate and it was a good place to mount a last stand or, or a defense. Yellow dust covered everything, blown on a mournful wind. They climbed into clouds, the winding Swart Peak Road. When they passed below Emei Mountain, few watched them. Their flags were dark and dull in the fading light. So the army crosses. It crosses the famous Sword Peak Road. Uh, this was a famous, very, very narrow road up in the mountains leading to, to Shu. In fact, I think there is a poem by uh, Tang Xuanzun, by the emperor, describing this peak and how he passed it and, and uh, the circumstances, the horrible circumstances in which he passed it. And he climbs below, they pass Emei Mountain, which is one of the famous mountains in, in Shu, although not that close to, to Sword Peak Road. Uh, perhaps it's only mentioned because it's a famous mountain in Shu. But anyway, the, what, this, what this stanza represents is how amid dust de and desolation, outer and inner, the emperor manages to make his way with his troops to Shu. Shu rivers still ran blue, Shu mountains remained green. Oblivious to all, grief filled his endless days and nights. Moonlight in the borrowed palace only wrenched his heart the more. On rainy nights, bells rung his heart. So we're in Shu, which is a land of beauty, but the emperor is sleepless, unhappy, filled with grief in days and nights. The endlessness that he had sought in the beginning, in the endless pleasures and the endless spring with Yang Guifei, are now an endless insomnia, nights where he cannot sleep and where he can only suffer, sighing for his departed bell. Uh, so this connects with another of the topical, so here we, we get an introduction of one of the sub-themes of a lot of Chinese poetry, wakefulness at night, and not being able to sleep because one is missing or suffering from another person. 
And uh, we also get this um, very Chinese, although it is present in Western po poetry, but this conceit of the pathetic fallacy, the idea that nature should and does um, react to human suffering, that there is a connection between the microcosm of humanity, of the individual, of social human activity, and the macrocosm of nature. And this is sometimes presented in poems uh, by affirming it, by, you know, uh, by establishing that in a happy season the poet is happy, or that in a sad season the poet is sad. But here it is contrasted. Like, how can nature be green and beautiful in Shu when the emperor's heart is black and dead? Time passed. At last he journeyed homeward. But when he reached that spot again, he stopped, could not go on. Below my way slope, into the muddy earth, her pale face was gone, the scene of her death just emptiness. So the, the capital has been uh, recovered. The imperial cortege is going back to the capital, although now Xuanzong has abdicated. He is only the uh, emperor emeritus going back to the capital. He passes through the place just before reaching Chang'an, where his beloved was murdered, and he feels desolate. Not only him, Lords and ministers eyed each other, robes soaked with tears. Looking east toward the palace gates, their horses led them home. They returned to find her ponds and gardens as before. Lake Taiye Hibiscus and Weiyang Palace Willows. So the imperial cortege returns to the capital and you have this paradoxical scene that appears a, a lot in, in, in other historical events uh, when, when, when restorations take place. I'm thinking of uh, the time after the French Revolution or I'm thinking about the restoration in Britain when the king returns or his descendants and the noblemen return from exile, everything feels different. So the spaces are the same spaces, but the people are no longer the same people, and the times are no longer the same times. So the palaces in the old capital, they're still there. The lakes, uh, the palaces, and, and the plants surrounding those lakes and palaces are still there, but times have passed. Jiang Wifei is dead. Everybody is older, and the empire is in decline. Incidentally, Lake Taiye and the Weijang Palace don't refer to actual palaces and constructions of, of, of Tang, Chang'an. They, are, uh, they, they were built under Emperor Han Wudi in what was then Han, the Han capital Chang'an. But, you know, uh, remember the conceit at the start of the poem that this is a poem about a Han emperor. So it's appropriate perhaps to mention these uh, Han dynasty constructions that no longer existed at the time of the Tang. Hibiscuses by the lake, willows by the palace, and they will be connected with Jiang Wifei in the next stanza. The hibiscus, like her face, the willows, her eyebrows. Seeing all this, how could his tears not fall? In spring wind, peach and plum both blossomed. In fall rain, tongue trees dropped their leaves. So the seasons pass, the beauty of spring comes but the emperor can only think on crying, and like rain on the Tung tree leaves, his tears fall endlessly. Western palace, southern hall, grew thick with autumn grass. Red leaves fell and covered stairs where no one swept. The actors and dancers of her pear garden all grew gray. The eunuchs of her private suit, sweet, aged like fading flowers. We continue with this. The palaces are there, but they're abandoned. Yang Wifei no longer lives in them, and they are left to the elements. Autumn comes, which is the melancholy season par excellence in Chinese poetry. And uh, the people who used to enjoy the revelries of the emperor and his, and his favored concert, the musicians of the pear garden, the eunuchs that looked after her, they've all become old. Time passes. At dusk in his rooms, he shared his quiet thoughts with fireflies. His single lamp flickered out. Sleep could not find him. Drums and bells told the hour slowly in the endless night, till a gleam in the stars. Tall dawn would come at last. So again, like in Shu, the emperor's nights are sleepless. He remains all night awake until his candles uh, 
extinguish themselves, and he remains awake and, and suffering in bed. On nights so cold, frost grayed, the bright mandarin ducks on the roof tiles. He was chill beneath the kingfisher quilt that none could share. The living and the dead, apart, a year went by, and her ghost never came to him, even in dreams. So the reference to the mandarin ducks and the roof tiles is probably a, a, an, an artwork, a piece of terracotta in the shape of mandarin ducks that has been placed on the roof tiles. is significant. Mandarin ducks are a symbol in Chinese uh, tradition of um, fidelity because they, they, they are this type of birds that match for life and don't change their couple. And so a poignant image covered in the cold of the frost, just as the heart of the emperor is covered in the coldness of pain of being parted from his mandarin duck. The emperor can't sleep, and now we transition to the next uh, stanza. The emperor hopes to see his beloved in dreams at least, but not even in dreams does she come to him and a year has passed. So now begins the next section, the quest, the quest for finding her spirit. There was a Taoist from Lin Chiang, then dwelling in the capital, pure of heart. He could bring back souls from the dead, they said. Moved by the emperor's deep grief, he sent his disciples to seek her in every quarter. This is pretty straightforward. This Taoist sage is supposed to be able he, to, to bring the souls of the dead. He's going to start a search for Zhang Guifei's soul to at least try to transmit a message to her or to get her to visit the emperor. They rose into the sky and flew like lightning and soaring to the heavens or deep under the earth, gazed up into the endless blue and deep as the yellow springs. But both they found empty. She was not there. So the heavens are scouted in case she has become an immortal. The depths of the earth, the yellow springs, where all the ordinary dead people go, but she's nowhere to be seen. Then he heard of a magical island out in the eastern sea, a mountain dividing nowhere from the very edge of nothing. So I imagine this is a reference to Peng Lai. Peng Lai was believed to be an island or group of islands in the East China Sea, uh, where the immortals dwelt. And in fact, under the first emperor, under Qing Shi Huang Di, naval expeditions have been sent in search of this island and of immortality, if it could be attained by, by conquering these islands or getting an elixir from them. It is in these islands of the immortals, in the very edge of the world, of the universe, that a promising sign appears. There the Tao sage will encounter the woman. At its peak, Magnificent towers rose into multicolored clouds. There, beautiful spirits lived eternities. One was a woman called Most Faithful. Snowy skin and lovely face. Was she the one they sought? So the description of this Taoist paradise is similar to the description of the courtly world in which Zhang Guifei and the emperor lived beforehand. So there is a mirror reflection. Zhang Guifei is still living amidst gold and beauty and multicolored clouds and slender, incredibly beautiful celestial pavilions. But now she's alone and now she's a spirit. Most faithful, I think was a sobriquet, a nickname that she used for herself when she was alive. He knocked on the jeweled door of her gold tower's western chamber and asked the maid Little Jade to announce him. News of a heavenly envoy from the Emperor of the Han broke into her dreams as she slept within nine flowered curtains. So it's pretty straightforward. She wakes up, there is an emissary from the Han Emperor at the door. She rushes to encounter him. Reaching for her gown, pushing away her pillow, she stood unsteady and then she parted her pearl curtains and her silver screen. Just awake, her cloud-like hair was all dishevelled. Her flowered headdress leaned askew as she came into the hall. So we're getting indirect elements pointing that, is she, is, she, is it she, is she not? We're getting different elements that point in the direction of it being her. Yeah? The nickname she has, the cloud-like hair that she has, which was already mentioned at the beginning of the poem. A breeze blew open her fairy cloak. It rippled and fluttered, as if she danced again the rainbow dress and the feathered coat. Her sad, lonely face was awash in tears, like a sprig of pear blossoms 
wet with the rain of spring again. So it's clearly she. It's clearly her. Yeah. The one lady who once danced rainbow dress and feathered coat. This image of pear blossoms wet with the rain as a, as a symbol of tears of crying would become a Chinese idiom later on. Touched, she met his eyes and thanked the emperor for sending this envoy. She said that since they had parted, she had never once heard his voice or seen his face. No longer could they share their love as in the shining palace. Alone here now in Paradise Hall, her days and months grew long. Sometimes she looked down into the world of the living, but she never saw Chang'an, only the dust and fog of war that covered it. Now she offered two old tokens of her deepest fillings, a case of silver filigree and a hairpin of gold to send home with the envoy. You will remember that when the, her death, when the death of Zhang Guifei was being described, some elements that she was wearing were mentioned that broke down a hairpin, a golden hairpin, and uh, I don't remember which was the other one. But anyway, just as she wore jewels when she died, she wears jewels now, and she sends some of those jewels, which the emperor was not able to retrieve then, she sends them back as tokens to him. She cannot go in person. She is separated forever from the emperor, or at least for a long time. She is an immortal, and he is a mortal. But she sends these trinkets, and uh, only one half, because she hopes someday, against all hope, to be able to see him again. Of the pin, she kept half. Of the case, one panel, breaking the gold of the pin and splitting the silver of the case. She prayed his love would last as long as the gold and silver, so that someday, in heaven or on earth, they might meet again. Finally, the last stanza concludes with the parting. And to verify that uh, the envoy really did encounter um, Jiang Guifei's spirit, transmuted into an immortal, Jiang Guifei is going to reveal something that only the emperor knows. As the envoy left, she begged him also to carry back a message, whose words were a vow that only they too would ever know. On the seventh night of the seventh month in the palace of long life, at midnight they had promised where none could overhear them. In the sky we will be like birds with shared wings, on earth like trees with branches intertwined. Heaven is ancient, the world is old, but they will die. This sorrow, like an endless thread, will last forever. So Jiang Wifei gives these tokens to confirm the emperor that it is indeed her who is now living in the Isles of the Immortals, that she wishes to see him. But the poem ends on a tragic note. It doesn't mention the possibility or, or the fact or if the emperor was in death or in some future time reunited with Jiang Wifei. It just stands on a melancholy sad note saying, Earth lasts long, the heavens longer, but they will end. And yet this pain, this suffering at separation will never end like an endless cord. So, quite a nice poem, a bit melodramatic, uh, but quite a nice work of art. But indeed, as I said uh, before, uh, Bai Yuji would probably prefer to be remembered not for this poem, but for others. Uh, and probably not the next one, which is also by, um, by him, which is also by Bai Yuji, but others that might appear in this collection will probably be more to his liking, even if not to ours. <laughs>